So good morning, everybody, to our IDSA webinar on the IDS Reference Architecture Model 2.0. My, my name is Sebastian Steinbus. I'm the lead architect of the IDSA, and I'm very happy that today Gerd Bruch from the Fraunhofer Institute for Applied and Integrated Security, ISEC, will talk about the security perspective of the Reference Architecture Model, about the trust in the IDS Reference Architecture. If you're going to join our webinar today uh, live, you can ask your questions afterwards in the questions and answers block. You can ask directly then or write your questions down in the chat immediately. I will read them out loud afterwards. If you join our webinar on YouTube, just comment below and come back to us via email or give us a call. If you like this webinar, just hit the like button below. Gerd, I'm very happy to have you here today on your talk on the security perspective, so please go ahead. Thank you, Sebastian. Um, my name is Gerd Brost. I'm working for the Fraunhofer ISEC. Uh, we do security in every aspect, and this is why um, I'm working for the uh, IDS uh, security architecture. Um, and I'm working for the, uh, working towards this topic, uh, I believe, for the last four years, so so quite some time now. Uh, and I'm pretty happy that we are uh, making quite some progress. Today, I would like to talk about um, the trust and security in the IDS and the different um, architectural aspects we have there and the different uh, mechanisms we have uh, devised. So, I know. So, um, what is special about um, the industrial data space? We have um, a lot of um, security challenges that are quite new. Just to pick off out very few examples, um, we have um, a data marketplace. We have uh, different uh, participants from different um, domains. So we have ad hoc communication relationships between partners. Um, we have a lot of industry for um, use cases where we have fixed VPN connections, where we have specific workflows designed. But here we have a new, we try to build a new world where we have ad hoc communications, anyone can connect, uh, try to request data from other connectors. So we need to acquire trusted information about the partner connectors to um, build trust uh, and security in the IDS. What we also want to do is we start from this industrial um, data space um, point, or we started with that at the beginning. Now it starts to, to spread also to other application domains like medical data space. And uh, for example, last time I had an invitation for, um, invitation for uh, a nautical data space. So maybe not all of that is going to, to get reality, but um, we have very different industries that are to be connected in the future and all of them have different needs and standards that we have to adapt for that. So if we take care of medical data, they have much different requirements than industry, for example, because in the industrial context, most of the time um, safety uh, is also a very important issue where in the medical um, space, the current applications um, have the protection of the patient data um, as, as the top requirement. So um, we need an adaptable system, something that is pretty uh, flexible. And if we think about access and usage control, we need something that is strong, but uh, still so adaptable that, that we can um, use it for different uh, industrial sectors. Um, and if we, if we talk about a data marketplace, one of the core functionalities is that we have a flexible and um, pluggable system for, for apps, how we call them. Uh, which are basically uh, Microsoft uh, microservices, um, where we make it possible to to de design data flows, to transform data from different sources, to aggregate data, to offer this over the IDS, um, which is a pretty broad attack surface there. And we need, um, for the one hand, if we have a data app, um, it must be very rel reliable. On the other hand, um, we must make sure that there is no malicious code inside and uh, data cannot be exfiltrated from workflows, um, which uh, the apps is, or, or we, we want to pre uh, prevent any kind of behavior um, that malicious apps, uh, apps could uh, develop, for example. So um, we, we, we um, have to have kind of design principles in mind when, when designing this. So um, we, we try not to reinvent the wheel. We had a lot, lot of questions. Um, how, why do you do it like this? And um, 
Do you use existing industry standards? Yeah, we try to to use existing standards whenever possible. We don't want to um, have fun design. We have fun designing new technical system, which is true, but uh, we still try to use everything that's on the market because if we have a large scale system really on the market, you you don't want to have prototypical solutions um, when it's not totally necessary. We want to have something like um, scalable and transparent trust, which means um, we have a very limit. We have a limited set of security requirements, for example, for the base connector, to do um, demonstrations, to do specific workflows and showcases. Um, and uh, still, we have very complex high security features um, also designed. And uh, data sovereignty as one of the core principles of the IDS means. We, we want to um, have the freedom of choice so everyone can decide what kind of security requirements are attached to data sources um, anyone is offering. Um, and um, the third principle uh, directly arises from that because later on um, security will pay off because if you have uh, high value services with data that has a price tag on it, which is our uh, final vision, um, then uh, you, you will see that that uh, companies are going to um, raise the level of security that is needed to to access this kind of data. So um, the evolution of the security, um, just to 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 sketch it a little bit, um, we have a lot of stuff that is already there on the, on the market. Um, if we if we start on the lower level, the confidential authentic communication is the baseline baseline for everything else. If you cannot transmit uh, data in a secure way, it's um, it doesn't have a lot of meaning. Um, but this is already there, there, and this is what I said about uh, reusing existing principles. Um, for example, TLS tunnels are uh, a very um, old and and uh, good technology, and uh, we use whatever is there. But um, building on that, um, we need to to do. Uh, for example, remote attestation, I'm going to, to uh, get to that later. Um, we need some kind of trusted platform to um, run our data services. We need um, to get an understanding what it means if a different connector is secure or not. So we need some kind of security profile to um, to have an idea um, and how to, to, uh, um, to specify the requirements uh, of data I'm offering. We need some kind of attribute-based fine-grained access control, which is strong and flexible. And uh, like the, the pinnacle of current security development is this data usage control, where I can not only control data before it's accessed, but even after that. And all of this needs um, a lot of technology, uh, technological uh, development and needs a lot of define, uh, refining. But uh, like I said before, we are on a very good way there. And I'm happy that we have the chance in this project to work on these topics for a number of years now, because um, this is something that's still needed and uh, is not on the market so far. So um, everyone who, who watched a webinar or an IDS presentation before knows um, this picture, just for completeness. Um, I wanted to show it again, because the IDS sees itself not as a technology that is replacing, uh, replacing existing technologies and marketplaces, but it's more like a gluing component because, um, between these. Uh, you could run the IDS uh, standalone on itself, but uh, you have a lot of solutions out there. You have an S SAP uh, cloud, you have some kind of, I don't know, Bosch has solutions, Siemens uh, has Mindsphere, a lot of uh, marketplaces and then cloud solutions are out there. And we don't want to replace them or be a um, system that is a rival of the system, but we want to be something that tries to harmonize all of those solutions. Um, we want to write protocol adapters, we want to transfer data formats, we want to um, enable also small and medium enterprises who are not uh, part of one of those big solutions, which are also often uh, expensive solutions, um, to be able to, to be part of the game. If we drill down a bit on the IDS um, architecture um, itself, um, I'm sure you also know uh, this picture or something something alike. Um, but the main um, message here is that the IDS connector is a central component and it's very, very important that it's secure. 
and um, it's the component where all the services on the S are running, uh, IDS are running on. So if we have an enterprise that's offering data, you have data services running on a connector, the app store is running um, on top of the IDS connector, um, the broker is running on top of the IDS connector. So if we have a problem with the IDS connector and its security, we have a problem with the IDS. And this is why security is one of the central topics here. And this is why um, we have a specific um, um, webinar about security. So um, what happened so far is we, for um, yeah, we started with the with the IDS as the industrial data space, and for many of us, including me, it's still somehow the industrial data space because it's it's what we started to do um, four years ago. We we have a number of um, public funded uh, research projects. Um, where we try to to uh, develop this architecture and also implement some kind of reference uh, implementation. Um, as a part uh, activity of that, uh, the Industrial Data Space Association was uh, founded to get the input of the industry. And uh, now it's the other way around. Now the um, Industrial Data Space Association plans the webinars and invites us to give the talks, um, which is a very good thing. And um, besides of that, we also started some um, standardization activity. Um, we started to do the DeanSpec uh, 27070, which means to define an industrial gateway uh, for um, all of all, all different uh, um, industrial security applications. Um, and we have a certification scheme to make sure that um, if a connector gets uh, certified with a certain security level, that all of these requirements uh, that are mapped to a connector are also um, present. So um, one of the, the most important publications uh, in the last time regarding uh, IoT devices and um, highly secure devices in general um, it was a paper of Gail and Hunt and George Leti uh, and uh, Edmund Nightingale. Um, they called it the seven properties of highly secure devices and they started to uh, device requirements for, for um, yeah, secure devices in the IoT context, uh, context. And those guys are from Microsoft Research. And uh, this is a very nice paper because it gives, it gives a very good structure of the security proper properties and you get a really good idea what needs to be done to get a device secure. So um, the one thing is you need, you need a hardware based root of trust. So you cannot um, clone a device and cannot forge cryptographic keys. Um, you should have a small trust in computing base, meaning if you have very limited um, source code, then you have a very limited attack surface. Um, you should use defense in depth, uh, which is a pretty old principle, meaning um, you shouldn't rely on a single security mechanism, but you should try to, to stack the security mechanisms, uh, stuff that's uh, pretty well known, for example, in the networking world, uh, where you shouldn't rely on a single um, firewall as a single point of failure, but you should uh, stack your defenses if possible. Um, compartment, uh, compartment a compartmentalization means um, you have to to uh, enforce barriers between the different software com uh, components. And um, there are three more. The one is certificate-based authentication. So you have a proven identity um, that cannot be cloned. You have uh, renewable security, meaning you have to um, make sure that uh, the system is patchable and is kept updated in uh, the future. And you have failure reporting, which means if something breaks and uh, this still might be possible, then at least we want to know about that. So this is how we, we try to um, also design our security architecture because we try to find um, answers to the questions how we could achieve all of those properties. So um, we have the hardware-based root of trust. Uh, we we, understand, we support um, TPMs uh, at the moment. Um, we have a small, very small trusted computing base as far as possible, at least in our um, reference uh, implementation. Um, we have defense in depth where we have uh, usage and access control, not only um, based on, on a single mechanism, but, but we try to, to stack them as well as possible. We have a um, 
isolation-based approach um, using containers to uh, separate the data services and apps from each other, which satisfies the property of uh, compartment, uh, compartmentalization. Um, we have a certificate-based authentication. I'm um, going to explain a little bit later. We have uh, renewable security as a patch and monitoring um, uh, a process, which is uh, currently established together with the IDS Association. Um, and we have an um, audit log uh, logging mechanisms to, to do the failure reporting, which is also very important if you are um, trying to commercialize data, because then in the end, if you have some kind of dispute, you have to resolve that. So the basic building blocks um, our security architecture consists of is um, as the baseline is a trusted platform, meaning we have some kind of, um, in our world, this is the connector. Yeah, it must be trusted, trusted and trustworthy. Um, we have a certification scheme um, for that. Uh, it needs to isolate different services. We need uh, trustworthy communication, like I said, which is one of the foundational la layers where I must be able to make sure um, to know who I'm talking to and that the data is confidential when it's transmitted and it cannot be altered. Um, I need a very robust uh, identity and trust management um, and I need uh, access and usage control to make sure uh, who's able to access my data and maybe I'm even sure to control the data after it left, um, it left my own uh, connector. So the first point, I'm now going to, to um, highlight all of these fields a little bit more. Uh, the first point is the um, trusted platform. Um, what we did in the research projects is um, we, we designed the trusted IDS connector, which is a software stock I'm going to, to talk about later. Um, this is not the only solution for a trusted connector. Um, the R security architecture and the standardization approach aim to um, specify requirements and specify functionality that must be present. Um, since this is our open source implementation, um, it's free to, to use and it's free to take a look at. So um, if anyone um, builds his own system and satisfies satisfy all of these requirements, then we are very happy with that. Um, but since it's the, this is the system I know best and we try to, to implement it as some kind of proof of concept for the security architecture, um, I am referring this uh, from time to time. But this is not the only um, solution. I'm going uh, about the implementation a little bit um, more afterwards. Um, but um, I just wanted to, to bring up a small example so anyone who is not that deep into the connector uh, concept gets an idea of, of what kind of functionality we are talking about. So um, here we have this um, kind of um, container enabled architecture of a trusted connector. Um, you can replace, um, I tried to keep this picture without implementation details because you can replace all of that. Yeah, it, it doesn't matter what kind of kernel you use um, as, as long as it's uh, a secure kernel. Um, it, it doesn't matter what kind of container management layer you use as long as you satisfy, satisfy the security requirements for certification um, and from the standardization. Um, but uh, the principles in the architecture are always the same. You have um, some kind of container management layer that separates uh, the services and also separates the core uh, platform or the core container, which is um, um, always some kind of um, um, powerful platform that uh, controls the rest of the system. And it has special uh, privileges and is able to config uh, configure the container management layer. And a typical use case would be, we have a data service that generates data itself or it gets um, data from sensors in our production line, for example. Um, we can have a number of data services and one of the typical use cases would be, we want to offer this data to another connector. So uh, we feed it through an aggregation service, um, which makes sure that um, the level of um, privacy related data, for example, is reduced so we can safely and legally comply and give it out to other parties. Um, and this happens by um, routing this through, through our routing engine. So we can um, define a number of policies that make sure that data is going through an aggregation service, for example, before leaving um, the connector. And uh, we have certain um, policy enforcement points in, uh, inside of the architecture to make sure that uh, 
that we know who we are talking to, that uh, the other connector uh, matches a certain uh, security profile, it speaks a certain type of uh, protocol, for example, um, and we are able to, for example, enforce uh, usage control policies on the other side. So um, what we also did in the security architecture, I will not go too deeply into that, but I just want to mention it. Um, in the end, we are going to have a very complex um, software architecture because we have connectors, we have services running on top of these connectors, we have um, not only data, to services on the um, industrial side or the, the participant side, but we also have infrastructure services like a broker, uh, like an app store, and also the identity provisioning services. And for that, we need um, a lot of different trust schemes. In the future, it will be mandatory to uh, sign your software if you want to offer an app, for example. It, it uh, is mandatory that um, everyone who downloads some kind of app and deploys it to its own connector uh, can make an integrity check um, if this app hasn't been tampered with, for example. And we also want to make sure that we have a trusted identity attached to that so we know it's coming from a valid uh, software developer. Um, we have these con concepts pretty far, but uh, currently in the IDS, the implementation um, is lagging a little bit behind because we are um, right now bootstrapping the whole uh, ecosystem and we need to integrate it step by step. So um, this is uh, also done, but um, we are working on uh, also implementing that just as a highlight. So um, before I talked about um, security profiles, and that we want to somehow have um, an idea of the security properties um, of a connector, for example. And uh, we used um, the seven principles um, I showed before as a baseline, transformed them a little bit to um, IDS uh, needs and requirements, and um, came up with this um, capability table where um, we're going from level zero to level two. Um, the most important thing here is that um, you could, at least for now, it still works that you can um, can map all the security requirements and security capabilities of the different components to this table. Yeah? And um, the idea would be one day to have a connector that matches the um, level two in all aspects. We're currently working on that. Um, as an example, the current uh, trusted connector release uh, from November 2018 um, is here, and our roadmap would be to have a level two on all aspects. But um, the main message here is that the security profiles are used um, also as a logical concept uh, in the information model for all the connectors to, um, to uh, inform each other about the security capabilities and uh, that you get a really uh, more formalized understanding of the um, security requirements. So on the one hand, uh, the connector who requests data can uh, state his security uh, um, uh, capabilities. The uh, offering connector can check these um, if they are true, either by certification or doing um, specific security uh, checks for himself. Um, but you can also use this to um, specify security requirements um, for the data services you're offering. So um, what uh, now we, we try to bridge the gap between um, technical security requirements and also the uh, certification and the standardization. Um, and this is why we des de designed uh, three security profiles, which map to the table I showed you before. So we have the baseline profile, which is more or less the base connector. Um, it has a set of security requirements we see as mandatory because below that, it's just not possible to uh, call this IDS in any way. So uh, we need to have authenticated um, and encrypted communication. We need to have some mean of isolation between the apps. We need to have some basic logging functionality. We need to make sure that all privileged accounts are protected. And um, with all of that, we, we try to protect against basic threats. 
But if you want to go a step further and really offer high value data, medical data, person related data, and all kinds of data with some kind of special security requirement set, then um, you should um, upgrade to a connector with, with the trusted profile, which means we have really strong isolation between apps. Um, we have um, resource protection of apps, meaning they have execution guarantees, so they will not run out of memory, for example. Um, we have integrity protection of the software, so we have code signing and we have integrity checks before loading a container, for example. We have audit logging, which makes it uh, traceable if something goes, goes wrong, what I mentioned before. Mm, we have uh, secure data erasure, meaning if we, if we delete data, it's, it's really gone, and not just um, like a normal operating system um, that the first byte is, is overwritten and it can easily be restored. We have a hardware-based uh, trust. Anchor, uh, meaning the device cannot be forged and key handling can be made secure and um, even remote integrity verification is going to be able uh, using hardware based trust anchor. And one thing that's still um, in the making and it's not that there is the trusted profile plus, uh, meaning that we have um, protection of all data while in memory and we have protection against malicious administrators and um, Everyone who's coming from the technical side knows this is one of the um, most difficult challenges because you must make sure that any administrator who has a privileged account uh, on the server and is able to log in is not able by any means to um, look into the data that is currently being transmitted, for example, um, or into process space. So. Uh, um, currently, there are a number of uh, new promising uh, technologies on the market like Intel SGX, um, the same from, from AMD, but um, this is currently kind of part of the research projects. We're working on that to get the first prototypes going, um, and this is where the current industry is heading as a whole, I believe, but uh, we're still working on that. So the next um, building block was identity and uh, trust management. Mm, I will not go too deeply into the definitions and uh, all the formal aspects. The most important thing is um, if you talk about an identity provider, it's someone who can um, issue identity attributes. So uh, normally, if we're talking about computer system, we are talking about X509 certificates. Um, but an identity is not the certificate. An identity is the number of um, of uh, attributes that are assigned to an entity. So um, the identity provider as a whole can consist of different building blocks. Um, you will see this later on. Um, and the certificate authority, one of the basic um, identity management concepts currently out there in the web and all technical solutions is one of those aspects. Um, but it's also important, I nearly forgot about that, um, that the IDS certification body um, later on, this is to, uh, someone who is going to issue um, certification levels of the identity uh, of the IDS components, um, something we uh, had in the webinar um, about, I believe. Um, but uh, this has nothing to do with a, uh, nothing to do with the technical certificate. So these are different concepts. So um, the baseline principles here are um, there's, uh, we have a own certification authority. Uh, we have our own identity provider in the IDS. Um, currently it's one. In the future it doesn't have to be. In the future it's possible to scale that and to have different suppliers for that. But currently we just uh, bootstrap it with uh, one. Um, so we have the IDS certification. Uh, and requests uh, technical certificates, technical identities for an organization and for the connectors. Um, and on top of that, we have dynamic attributes that are handled by um, a special service I'm going to, to talk about in a few seconds, um, where we have something like uh, IDS membership that we can um, handle and that can be withdrawn without um, revoking the technical certificates of the identity. So um, to run a trust infrastructure, we need um, a few components that are a part of the infrastructure. Um, very important here is the certificate uh, authority. It's just um, 
something that's present in nearly every system. Um, we have a dynamic attribute provisioning service, which cares of the dynamic attributes. Um, and we also have the ability for special workflows to use a separate um, authorization service. I just wanted to mention it because it's also part of the reference architecture, but this is only for very special workflows where this is needed. So um, until it hits you, um, I think we can safely ignore that for now. Um, and for sure, the broker, it depends on the um, on your, your um, point of view. Um, could also be seen as some kind of um, part of the trust infrastructure, because if you um, really manipulate the broker, you can at least confuse the system, because um, a connector should be able to make sure the information he got from a broker that he can verify it uh, with a connector directly, so he can make sure that the broker information is right. But um, if you manipulate the broker and you cannot find any information in the IDS anymore, um, then it's at least an availability problem. Um, the other con um, component I didn't talk about so far is this IDS Software Trust repository, meaning if you do remote integ integrity verification of connectors, then um, you have um, you need some kind of central repository where you can check if this is a valid and allowed software configuration. This is marked as optional because it could be realized as a central component. Currently, we, we use it um, within the dynamic attribute provisioning service to um, have the fingerprints of the software running on a connector um, embedded into these tokens, but you can design it either way. So, um, for for um, identity and access uh, people, this is a very uh, straightforward topic. Um, but it's always important to make clear that uh, authentication and authorization are two different concepts. I'm not going too deep into that, but um, authentication means you have to make sure that we talk to the right entity. So someone is presenting a certificate, for example, and shows that um, he's an IDS participant and presents a um, um, dynamic token. Um, which says you are an IDS member, um, then you know who you're talking to, that it's a valid IDS member, and that you can share your data, for example. Um, but the authorization uh, means you not only know um, who you are talking with, but, with, but you also um, delegate, for example, access to resources, meaning you could use this uh, um, optional um, authorization service, as I said before, um, or you can also say, I want to have freedom of choice in my connector. I specify a number um, of policies which um, allow certain kind of uh, connector types to, allow, um, to, to access certain kind of data services. Um, currently, we, we have uh, the you know, two different kind of certificates um, in the making. We have an organization certificate um, which can be used to uh, sign, for example, contracts. It can be used to um, request in, on, in an electronic way um, certificates for connectors. Um, for the bootstrapping phase, the most important aspect is the um, certificate of a, of a connector, which is the core identity um, in the IDS. And uh, important is we try to keep it to a bare minimum. So we, we really have nearly nothing in there and everything is done by dynamic attributes in a, spe a special token. Um, this is because attribute re uh, revocation means uh, certificate revocation. And if we have um, dynamic identity attributes, for example, an IDS membership a certification uh, status that is able to expire, um, if we have a temporal degradation of service and want to reflect that in some kind of attribute, um, if you put all of that into a certificate, it means if you revoke that certificate, you revo revoke the identity of a connector. And uh, this might have consequences we don't really want, so we try to, to separate it a little bit. Um, still sticking with the certificates, um, there will be a number of uh, sub-CAs. Um, usually you try to, to have every um, concern mapped by a special uh, sub-CA and not a huge um, CA for all of the certificates, because um, if you have a 
compromise with the central uh, CA, it means you have to rework uh, all the certificates that have ever been issued. So it makes sense to to hand it out uh, to to hand it out to different uh, sub CAs, and it's also um, handy to um, get this job um, also, for example. Um, handed over to different uh, sub companies who care, take care of special um, uh, topics, for example. So we have the, the device sub CA, which, which specifies the identity of all the connectors in the IDS. Um, you have maybe a TLS sub CA um, where you just uh, issue really short lived certificates for TLS tunneling. Um, you have something like the software developer sub CA where you are able to sign your services or apps before um, uploading them to the app store. Um, and we have something we call the uh, software authority sub CA, which means um, we have um, a certificate for infrastructure services. Because if you have a broker running in the IDS or an app store, these are really security uh, relevant infrastructural services. And if those are compromised, you're going to, bring, to have a problem. So it makes uh, sense to have a certificate that verifies that this kind of connector currently is allowed to um, offer some kind of infrastructure service. So, um, I've been talking a lot about certificates. Um, like I said, that we have this uh, TLS certificates, which are um, designed to be very short-lived, uh, the device certificate as a central identity. And we have this dynamic um, attribute token. And this uh, dynamic attribute token is coming from the dynamic attribute provisioning service, the DAPS, as we call it. And this is one of the um, central aspect of uh, Dynamic entity, uh, dynamic uh, identity handling in the in the IDS. Um, these um, attributes are important because uh, every organization and every connector um, they have um, attributes that that come from the uh, special design aspects of the IDS. You have some kind of IDS membership status um, that you have to refresh. Um, we have. Um, Maybe uh, or we, we have a mandatory certification level uh, for the organization. It may be um, that we start with this um, basic uh, certification at the beginning, but later on there is going to be more complex schemes. Um, and if also if you take a look at the IDS connector, um, you have a certification level also for that. You have a security profile. Um, you might have um, a security um, status attribute, for example. So all of those are dynamic attributes, and we won't uh, don't want to embed them into the uh, certificates. And this is why we have this dynamic attribute provisioning service to take care of this kind of um, attributes that can be um, revoked easily um, and can change over time. So if we take a look at the uh, Overall architecture here. Um, this you can also find in the reference architecture with the description. So um, I don't want to go too deep, do, uh, too deep into that. But um, the normal flow is you you have a connector certificate. Um, you present it to the dynamic attribute provisioning service. Um, then you get a token back, uh, which embeds uh, your dynamic attribute in the IDS, and you hand in this token to another connector uh, to a data service if you want to access a resource. And the other connector needs to specify a number of um, access policies um, that make sure his uh, own security requirements for the data he's trying to give out um, are matched before making um, access available. So I will skip that. Um, just to, to show um, it's not um, only PowerPoint um, computer science. We really designed the protocols. We re really designed the technical aspects of that. Um, if you have any concrete questions, um, don't hesitate to ask me. So um, one of the other aspects is uh, trustworthy communication. Um, we designed uh, the IDS communication protocol. And uh, this is one of the points where you surely get the question, um, why do we have, have to design your own protocol? Because there are so many protocols out there, why don't you use them? Um, we have a very very um, con concrete uh, motivation about that, because um, in the uh, protocol there's not so much magic. You can take a look at the source uh, tree on GitHub. 
Um, we use uh, WebSockets over TLS, which is baseline technology. We use, use uh, a protobuf um, um, as a transmission uh, protocol. Um, but the important thing is we couldn't use an off-the-shelf uh, protocol because there, there wasn't one. Because we are using um, state-of-the-art hardware security anchors like a TPM 2.0, and there still is no official remote attestation um, protocol available. This is why we had to, to build our own. Um, and also, we need some kind of protocol to exchange uh, policy information from one connector to the other, to exchange metadata, which is compliant to the information model. Um, and all of these um, are not there yet. As soon as there is something on the market uh, where we say, okay, um, this is a solution that's uh, industry standard, uh, then we are happy to use that and throw, uh, throw away our own um, implementations. But um, Currently, we don't see that, and um, um, with the baseline uh, communication patterns of the IDS, which is like a multi-part um, message over REST over HTTP, um, you cannot do all of the security functionality we need. So um, one of the, the core uh, features that we could try to enable is we want to support um, remote attestation, which means if you uh, want to access data on another connector, the connector is going to request your um, one unclonable identity, but he's also um, going to um, uh, request your um, assigned list of uh, software hashes. So um, if you if you use trusted boot, it means that um, on every aspect um, of the loaded booted system, so coming from the bootloader, going over the kernel to all the drivers and software components, um, this information is uh, stored in a, a trusted platform module, a TPM. Um, and this information is um, stored there um, by trusted components and you have a chain of trust that um, usually cannot be broken. This means if you uh, request the TPM of another computer, um, the server is not able to fake the values, even it has been, if it has been compromised afterwards, but the uh, values in the TPM um, are always valid and the identity uh, in there also. So um, you really have the possibility to make yourself sure that the certification level of a connector is still valid because the software stack is the one that has been certified, for example. Or you can um, de do uh, deductions about the security features uh, associ associated with the configuration um, and the containers that are deployed on there. So um, if we're talking about different uh, stages of trust or different trust uh, levels, you can Think of um, a normal device without a hardware anchor is, is untrusted. Then you can take it step uh, one step further and and uh, verify um, the integrity of the trust container management level and the core platform. Um, this is what we are very currently in our uh, referrals implementation. If you want to take it one step further, it would make sense to also attest the containers on the other side, but it's still something that's uh, in the making. So the last topic um, I wanted to um, discuss is the access and usage control concepts we have here. Um, access control regulates um, requests to connector endpoints. Um, the important thing about access control is um, after access is granted, um, traditionally you don't have any further control. So it's a yes, no decision. And you can make a decision based on a lot of information. You can see if the um, identity is the right one or has um, if the attributes match your security policies. You can uh, see um, if the remote attestation has been successful, for example, if uh, the software stack is in, uh, integrity protected and all of that. But um, to, to, and, and to realize data sovereignty, this is one important aspect. But um, another important aspect is uh, the notion of usage control, which, mean, which means you, for the one hand, you can uh, really define data flows that are allowed. You can really regulate processing of data and what needs to happen to data before it, for example, leaves the connector. Um, and you want to be able to attach uh, policies to a data and not only legal policies, but technical policies that can be enforced on the other side. Um, and uh, you 
also want to try to keep control of the data after it's uh, it left your own connector. Um, as long as it resides on another IDS certified component, you should be able, um, or a component that supports usage control, you should be able to keep a certain level of control over your data even after it left the connector. This is a technical, uh, technically pretty challenging um, enterprise, um, but it's worthwhile because in the future we have to, uh, we are coming uh, towards very complex um, collaborations between different companies. Uh, the data amounts are going to increase, the data, um, the, the diversity of data sets is going to increase, so we are going to need that. But I'm, um, yeah, but I'm not going too deeply into that because um, there are different approaches in the IDS. We have our logic-based or label-based usage control. We have induced by Fraunhofer IESE. We have data provenance tracking um, by Fraunhofer IO IOSB. We have uh, the application control language, which is a new project from Fraunhofer ISS, uh, ISST. You see there are a lot of um, technological um, foundations there, a lot of variants, which uh, makes sense because, because each of them has um, its very specific um, profile it's going to satisfy. Um, but we had a webinar about that before, so I'm not going to, do, to dive into that. So if we're talking about um, Mac OS, then you see that sometimes these slides are not displayed as you expect them to be in the full presentation. Um, but what I wanted, really wanted to talk about was, was uh, that um, we have a, this trusted connector, like I said before, as a reference implementation to show that the aspects of the security architecture are working and that they can really be used. Um, and these red boxes are supposed to be on the left side to show that on the one hand you have the core platform container, um, it's a Java based um, uh, container um, which can be run on its own on Docker. Um, it's important that um, our whole stack um, we designed uh, uses trust me as the container management layer down below. Um, so this Linux kernel is a custom kernel with a very a uh, small footprint uh, where we have very specific network isolation features, for example. Um, and these both are separate uh, projects in GitHub and I invite you to take a look and to 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 check it out. Um, it's all free and, and uh, we are happy about everyone who's, um, or anyone who's willing to, to work with us on that. Um, we currently also have some other Fraunhofer uh, institutes um, join our ranks and also work on the source code and I would be very happy to also have industrial um, um, partners um, also work uh, with us. Um, if we take a look at the, the concrete um, implementation layer um, and the architectural layer, um, we see down below we have this hardware layer um, where we can uh, attach sensors and actors and we have the traditional network interfaces. We have uh, hardware-based um, trust um, anchors. We have a custom Linux kernel which um, does basically the same as Docker but uh, with a strong focus on security. Um, Docker has a strong focus on functionality which is very fine, um, but really we, we rather rely on a limited set of uh, functionality, but therefore uh, have security as the main goal. Um, and the memory footprint and the lines of code are, codes are very limited, so it's uh, pretty easy to, to get this certified. Um, we even have some, some common criteria um, certification in mind for that. So if you have really a highly secure um, use case, this could be uh, the weapon of choice, choice for example. Um, and on top of, top of that, we have um, service container and the core container, which is always, uh, like I said, the main concept here, that we have this container management layer below and the core container uh, at, the, uh, at the top. This is controlling the core, con uh, um, the, the kernel, um, sorry, the container management layer. Um, and uh, the technical design is that we use virtual services to connect uh, to, to the layer below, but I'm not going to 
deeply uh, into that. If you have any question about that, please uh, let us know. We are always happy to to um, communicate. So, if we take a look at the core comp container and to get uh, try to get a little bit more concrete here. Um, we designed it um, as a, a Java-based uh, framework um, with OSGI um, services. Um, if I talk about OSGI, some, some guys are going to uh, cry out in pain, but um, it's a very flexible uh, system to, to um, have services and just define the interfaces for interoperability. Um, it makes a lot of sense um, for our prototypical um, uh, development. So we have special components for audit logging uh, for our protocol. We have components for um, the container management, um, the data routes I was talking about before, um, the connection manager basically does the access management of data services that are offered to the outside. We have usage control components and you can plug everything there you want to use. You can plug our system, you can use and use, you can use uh, anything else on the market. It's pretty easy to integrate. Um, you have an administration GUI um, and you have this uh, separate access control manager to, um, which serves as a policy store, more or less. Um, so we try to, to um, cover all of these different aspects. Um, so we have a policy negotiation between two connectors. We have remote attestation, user control policy enforcement. Um, and we try to, to build the software system. So we got all these aspects covered, covered and can um, demonstrate all of that. So um, I think I skipped the technical details because uh, I wanted to talk a little bit more about the general security architecture here. Uh, one last thing um, I, I would like to bring up again, we have this Dean spec um, as a standardization activity which um, maps very well to the um, certification activities we have in the IDS. And um, this uh, tries to formalize a little bit the requirements we, we have in the security architecture and to make this available to a, um, a, broader, um, to a broader audience. And we try to um, have this as a first step tower, towards uh, in international standardization. Um, I don't know in the future if all this of this is going to be IDS or if this is going to be something bigger. I mean, we have the transformation of the industrial data space to the international data space. Um, so maybe this international data space together um, with the industrial inter uh, internet consortium, um, the W3C maybe, maybe we get to, to a standard set that really makes um, this thing available worldwide, which would be very nice. Um, and certification and testing is important to, to get a common understanding of trust. So um, what we did for the standardization, and I only will, will very shortly uh, go into that, we use the, the ISC 62.4.3, which is like um, the current developing standard for industrial automation and control systems. Um, it specifies a huge set of security requirements, process definitions, uh, development um, guidelines uh, for building con computer, let's, let's say network com uh, components in the industrial context. And we're trying to integrate there. Um, I will skip about the um, Dean spec slides a little bit. Um, the most, thing, most important thing is that uh, we try to, to cover um, this whole industrial data space um, architecture, also in our security architecture, and uh, to take care of all those components. So um, I'm now done with my uh, overview, and um, I'm happy about um, any questions. Thank you very much. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. That was uh, indeed uh, impressive uh, for me. Uh, as I know uh, about the security uh, of the IDS very much, at least, uh, it's still impressive for me. So uh, I would like to have the, have the first question. So sorry, did you get me right? I had a microphone problem. Uh, oh, oh, I got you. 
No, okay. So I would have a question, um, as it was very impressive um, what you've done so far. So my question would be, um, IDS doesn't make security easier, isn't it? It gives you an, a comprehensive approach, but it's not easier than before. That's true. Security, uh, unfortunately, never is easy. <laughs> and it gets, it gets much more complicated in the future. We have more and more networking and plugging together different architectures. But we try to um, work on it in a way that in the end it's going to be easy, still easy to configure and still easy to grasp the concepts. Um, what I showed, showed now is a lot of detail, a lot of um, uh, technical stuff. But in the end, if you if you look at the connector, it should be still be very manageable. And this is a tough goal. You're right. Yes, manageable is the one thing, but uh, as I said, in my opinion, it will not be easier. You have to do all those things to have a secure system, and it's not getting easier by some uh, voodoo uh, someone will attach there. It's just managing complexity. Um, this was very impressive in this talk. Oh, um, okay, now, now, now I also got the, the meaning of your question. Um, well, you're very right. From time to time, you st stumble upon... Um, very simple solutions regarding security and uh, most of these things are something like a magic box you plug, plug into your um, production system and then it's going to be secure but um, i never um, stumbled across a solution that really worked that way if you if you want to have a secure system you need to address all of those steps uh, all of those um, building blocks yes so again thank you from my side um, are there any other questions? There is nothing in the chat window. Um, any other questions for, from the ones who are listening today? If not so, uh, then I think we'll let uh, Gerd go to his backlog. And uh, thanks again, Gerd. Uh, thanks to all of you for listening today and uh, enjoy the rest of your day. Goodbye. Same to you. Bye-bye.